We are live again, broadcasting from Georgetown, Texas. This is Martin Slabretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, and we are here again on Sunday, April 8th, 2018, for Q&A, Chalcedon Q&A, a little bit of meat of the word. And uh, we usually uh, spend the first minute or so letting our folks get uh, in base, touch base with uh, uh, broadcasting us through the Chalcedon website. So once ground control lets me know that we're connected, then we'll start in earnest with the questions that have been accumulating over the last three weeks since we last had a Q&A. Uh, and so I have these handy at this point. Welcome to all. I see that uh, the folks are very interested in catching up with us today and probably have questions as soon as we get through with these. Our policy always, we do the written questions first and then get to the ones that are pending and I can imagine what some of those pending ones might be about. <laughs> so, hi Gwen, hi Becky, good to have you here with us. Matthew, Sean, and uh, Andrea, are we connected yet? Let me know. And if so, we'll go ahead with our questions. By the way, a reminder, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it at the end, tomorrow we're having a Book of the Month Club broadcast featuring The Cure of Souls by R.J. Rushdoony, and I'll be leading that along with Andrea uh, Schwartz, um, tomorrow night. If you haven't signed up for it, go ahead and... Oh, we're good to go. If you haven't signed up for it, go ahead and get to it. In fact, some of the points made in that book actually will probably come into play in some of our discussions today. So if you want to get in deeper into the gist of that, you're going to want to participate. Now, uh, you may not have time to buy the book and read it by tomorrow night. That's true. But it might uh, be interesting for you to participate in the Book of the Month anyway, even if it's just a listener ask a question or two, uh, because it's a very, very powerful volume. So, Kelly, Reigns, glad to have you. We will try to hit your question, too, that you posed recently. But the first question, the oldest question in the stack, is from Zachary Benson. We didn't get to it two, three weeks ago, so we're going to get to it today. And Chalcedon Foundation's in, too. I uh, love it. Wow, we're really accumulating listeners today. Must be an, uh, we must live in interesting times, to use the Chinese proverb. Zachary Benson asks, is it ever right to join a corrupt organization like the CIA for the purpose of leaking stories of corruption that are still, quote, classified, unquote? What about outing verifiably corrupt officials via leaks? So the question really boils down to that about deception and warfare and someone's preparation uh, to die as a spy. <laughs> because, as you well know, uh, Edward Snowden has been made an example of, and there's no secret that they want to try him for treason, which in America, civil law, is in fact a, uh, a capital crime. So, uh, if it's important enough to you to uh, believe that's your hill to die on, um, you may be able to do some good and open up things, but you may martyr yourself in the process. So, we can't be glib about it. It's, a, it's serious business. Can't just say, oh, we're going to go in there and uh, expose, uh, you know, shine all this light into the darkness. And darkness can fight back pretty good, too. Uh, now, the light will ultimately win because your labor is never in vain in the Lord, but the price can be high. So count the cost if you're going to go down that path. It's my advice to you. Uh, a lot of people may not like that answer, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the, uh, be mindful of where Edward Snowden is at the moment. Uh, perhaps we need more Edward Snowdens who are willing to take that risk, though. Question for Cassian Q&A. What are the biblical grounds for canceling a betrothal based upon passages like Deuteronomy 22, verses 23-24, which calls a betrothed woman the neighbor's wife, are the criteria the same? I'm asking because we know a certain couple. They are both professing Christians. They got engaged, and after some time, one of them came and canceled the engagement based solely upon a personal whim. Is the objective legal bond over? Or would it be an act of adultery for either of the parties to find and marry someone else? So here we have, again, this uh, massive divide between what biblical morality requires, biblical law, and what civil law and cultural n norms, so-called, uh, dictate. And so the notion of the betrothal as an actual covenant that is binding ha is a, now a loosened thing. It has lost meaning over time. It has decayed. There's been an erosion of biblical morality, so this becomes more or less a letter of intent uh, with back-out clauses as it's currently shaped in modern American jurisprudence. Uh, consequently, uh, on the civil realm, there will be no repercussions for this, uh, and it will not be treated as the Bible and God would treat it. So that's a big deal. People will uh, suddenly shift gears 
Well, while the church is watching and while things are going well, they'll say, well, we we're going to follow the Bible to the letter. The second something goes awry, all of a sudden, boom, well, we're going to follow the social norms that are accepted here instead. So we have this smorgasbord approach. And ultimately, that means my will be done and not God's will be done. Because the whole point of thy, God's will be done is even if it rubs us the wrong way. So the other message here is that they took the notion of betrothal and engagement very lightly. Uh, and that is a hazardous thing. It needs to be taken very, very seriously. And so until we elevate and refill all these biblical concepts with their true importance and weightiness, we're going to fall short in these areas and we're going to have these kind of stories and they're going to prop um, proliferate. There'll be more of them as a consequence of our light approach, slacking the law of God, treating it and esteeming it a light thing uh, compared to our wishes and wants. As the story is told here, uh, the engagement was broken on a personal whim uh, and therefore, boom, we have a catastrophe on our hands, a moral catastrophe. And Rush Dooney speaks about this a lot <laughs> in, in bringing out this verse from Proverbs about the, uh, the adulterous woman who dabs her a corner of her mouth with the napkin and says it is nothing. In other words, sin is just a light thing, like a little dirt at the corner of the mouth that we just have to dab off and we're good to go. And that's how people treat it, a light thing. And since we don't tra treat sin and violation of God's law seriously, we are in a world of hurt. And uh, all the repercussions that God builds into the universe, which is premised on his law, uh, then come to bear. The way of the transgressor is hard, the scripture informs us. We don't have to go that path. But we choose it anyway, and it leads to destruction. And here, uh, covenant breaking is a serious matter. It's one of the things listed in Romans 1, in all those various sins that are enumerated in sequence there. Covenant breakers, lovers of self, lovers of Yeah, he'll get the whole list. But right there in the middle. And so the breaking of this covenant uh, is a serious matter. What was not a serious matter was the making of the covenant, which made it seem trivial to break it on a personal whim, as the... Uh, questioner has asked. So what we really need to do is, of course, uh, restore the foundations. When the foundations are um, destroyed, what can the righteous do, the question is posed. And when the foundations are destroyed, our obligation as Christians is to rebuild new foundations. And that's the mission, new foundations. We, Abraham even looked for a city that hath foundations. That's an important element in that passage in uh, Hebrews. So here's another question. We have two more before uh, I have a few comments and we'll take questions from the, uh, the, the field here. Hi, Martin Celebretti. Thanks so much for covering my last question. The question for this Sunday is, how does post-millennialism answer 2 Timothy 3 where it implies that in the last days times will get worse instead of better? Thanks in advance. Well, there's two aspects to this and they've been covered very well by uh, uh, scholars. Uh, and thinkers. I always liked the way that uh, Dr. Gary DeMar addressed this point. Um, let me divide the two passages. One is that it's a contemporaneous comment about how things stood at the time that Paul was writing. The last days, if you will, of the, um, the Jewish empire, Judaism, standing at the temple, Israel as a nation prior to the Vespasianic War. So it is not something that looks off to the very end of time at all, <coughs> but something very different. The second aspect to this is that uh, the passage doesn't just close. <coughs> excuse me, doesn't just close with the comment that things are going to get worse to worse. It makes a comment about these people who withstand, like um, it uses the, the words Janus and Jambres, the names of the two sorcerers that withstood Moses. But uh, and it makes the comment it says, but they shall not prevail. Just like Janice and Jambres did not prevail. They failed in their ultimate mission. So too, those who withstand the faith will also not prevail. So they are on the losing side. And so even, that's again, we have to look at the whole context. When the passage concludes, we have to take seriously how it concludes. Uh, those who are all these things, lovers of self, quarrelsome, blah, 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 uh, deceitful, you know, love is wax cold, etc. I said, they will not prevail. Who will prevail? The, seed, the true seed of God moving forward through history, being faithful to the Savior who bought them with his blood. And they will prevail in history. So, two aspects. One, it's a contemporaneous comment dealing with what Paul is dealing with in his day-to-day -day life. You know, 
he was facing those various things, the love of brothers growing cold. Uh, false brothers, you know, he had that problem in spades, and consequently dealing with it. But he also said they will not prevail. He could say that with the eye of faith, knowing that he himself would be offered up, uh, that he would uh, taste the edge of uh, Nero's sword. Uh, and so to say it is a very faithful statement. It mean, is indicative of how deep his faith and trust in God was, that though he might perish, the cause of God would still be victorious. He preached a victorious Christ, a victorious church, and the victorious kingdom that would not fail to be given to another. All right, one more question from online, from Kelly Rains. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right. In Germany, it would be different. Hi, Mr. Sobretti. Will you clarify what is happening, generally speaking, in the area of family law, parental rights, and LGBT rights? How should we approach family issues when it comes to those openly professing sexual deviancy? A local candidate for district judge is a practicing lawyer and shared with me that sexual local, local sexual deviants want their parental rights defended in court, but local lawyers have turned them away. Uh, they said The said candidate's position is that it does not follow that someone will be a bad parent just because they are LGB or T or any other form of sexual deviant. She is not convinced, as others are, that children will be disciplined, discipled into similar sexual sins. It does raise the question, what do we do with the parental rights of the LGBT community? Does sexual deviancy annul or abrogate parental rights? These are all very, very interesting questions because they arise as a result of the um, lifting uh, in modern liberal Christendom of the law of God. Antinomianism has led to a lifting of the ordinances that deal with these questions, and consequently we are framing mischief using law, and so there's this mischief here. By the way, the actual opposite of this is now in play. When children are up for uh, adoption or fostering, sometimes a family that is openly Christian is bypassed and told, you don't qualify, you're in fact bigots say, and therefore we don't want them in that household, we want them in a more new, value neutral household, which isn't going to create the wrong kind of citizen in the future. So uh, it's actually working the exact opposite of how the scriptures should, should teach it, and this is a, a known problem. And again, this relates to that passage in Psalm 11.3, what do you do when the foundations are destroyed? You have to build new foundations. While I do not agree with the candidate in their position, uh, the, the issue is, is a complex one, and it is due to the fact that sin complicates everything. There's a lot of simplicity in a uh, nature, nation that is righteous and that has God's law as its charter and that commands the hearts and minds of men in it. We don't have that situation, therefore we're starting way behind the finish line. And in a sense, we are uh, inheriting uh, the results of previous generations' dereliction in their Christian's duties. So that's where we are at at the moment. Uh, so a complicated question, and what happens, of course, is that a lot of attorneys have to swear to uphold the law of the state in which they are on, on the bar. And if that is a problem for you, you may not be able to take the oath of office and accept under false pretenses. And, uh, and then we have even bigger problems with the, with the lawyer who um, is in, in that boat. Uh, I know of one individual who uh, offered to write an alternative um, oath to take to become an attorney in the state where he lives, uh, that one that was closer to what it was maybe 100 years ago, and that in essence fully observed what the state was looking for, but also added the biblical dimension that God's kingdom was overall. And the state rejected it and said, you must take our oath and promise to do it our way uh, with a, co a total commitment to our philosophy and our uh, doctrine of government and our notion of what is ultimate. And since he could not do that, he could not become a lawyer, even though he was like top of his class, law school, etc., etc. And, and so this is the thing that's faced here. Uh, there's a level of compromise involved in becoming an attorney, uh, given how some of these uh, oaths are administered and what the content of those oaths are. So. Yeah, that's the situation. Very sad one. Okay. John Andrew Wiesner. Greetings from Virginia. Greetings from Georgetown, Texas. Considering your recent stated views on the Sharon principle, subject I'm still unsettled on, what would be the lex talionis be for a minister of God's word who sinfully 
uh, bears false witness to tens of thousands of Christian interracial marriages by calling them adulterers simply because their marriage is apparently inter-ethnic. I can't read the rest of it, but I have a pretty good idea that this kind of question was going to pop up this week simply because uh, uh, the drawing of a line in the sand recently. So let's, uh, let's try to grapple with this question. First, there's the issue of light versus heat. The entering end of your word bringeth light, the scripture says. What is actually happening more often than not in many of these uh, Facebook discussions is the application of heat. Turn up the heat as opposed to turn on the light. So I'm already uh, suspicious at that point because we are, our calling is to be sons of light and not simply pure heat without the light. Uh, we need to be focused in the right direction and deal with things properly. This does not in any way, shape, or form minimize the injury done to individual parties, uh, and many of them, uh, due to propagation of an erroneous uh, idea or a concept. So, this boils down to several different things. I'm going to separate them. Some people want to put them all together in one lump sum and says, you must respond to this package. I will not respond to the package. I'll respond to each individual piece. And then we can take a look at how the package should be shaped at that point. First issue is uh, kinism proper. My view is that it uh, there has been some work done in dealing with the question, but it is not complete, it is, it is not adequate, and a lot of it is not the highest quality work. Uh, since it's a matter of light, and there's a question of whether how much light is in this idea, we then need to then apply, and I'm going to actually do a couple of examples of this to show uh, where we need to go uh, in the question of this uh, view this doctrinal position, such as it is, which we regard at Chalcedon to be uh, in error. But when you say that, then you have to say why you believe it is an error. And you can't simply say, well, um, the, it has to be a biblical reason. It has to be, I think, whole scriptures have not yet been touched that deal with this question. Uh, and that weakness is fatal to us. I, I'll give an example. I think one of the most important passages in scripture on this matter is Isaiah 19. And it's interesting to me because those who hold to the kinist position, and if you don't know what kinism is, uh, I would recommend you, there's a very good definition of it by uh, the blogger at designofprovidence.blogspot.com, I believe it is. And uh, he gives a very, very good definition. He also deals with the Rahab and Ruth questions that are usually raised. I'm not going to go to those passages. I think he did a reasonably decent job on those two. Not perfect, uh, but by some stretch he dealt with it. But this does not exhaust the problems with uh, dealing with the Kinnis position. So uh, the Kinnis position sometimes uh, is want to appeal to Isaiah 19 saying, look, Here's Egypt, here's Assyria. These nations are still distinct. You see that there's a distinction between the nations, and therefore they're perpetuated into the future. Uh, and so this is the view that is taken, uh, and it's supposedly taught there. And you could possibly get that if you don't read the entire chapter, from eight, verse 18 through to 25. There we get some interesting context that needs to be brought to the table. And it's what is said of these nations that becomes important. It says that there's a, uh, a highway built between Assyria and Egypt. And he says, and the Assyrian is, goes into Egypt, and the Egyptian goes into Assyria. And they both worship God together. There's absolute common concourse. There's absolute, uh, if you want to call it free borders, you know, there's another topic the, of uh, controversy. There it is. They simply are moving together across the highway between them freely, and they're both worshiping God. And what's even more interesting is that the final verses from 23, 24, 25, is that uh, God puts Egypt, which is descended from Ham, Misraim, uh, first in the list. See, order is very important in Hebrew. Primogenitor, things on this notion, the notion of the firstborn. Uh, when you, God puts things in order, then that is prioritizing it in that way. And Egypt is prioritized first, and then Assyria, and then it says, and then Israel, the third part, in, in the third position. So it's first Egypt, second Assyria, third Israel. So you see that these nations are put in an order that makes no sense unless you're anti-Semitic, actually. In fact, it's probably the most anti-Semitic chapter in the entire Old Testament, if by Semitism you mean you have to promote Israel at all costs. When Isaiah gets his hands on this doctrine, he puts them under, or behind, if you will, uh, the, 
the Hamitic nation at that point is Egypt. Uh, but they're all working together, you see. Uh, and what really happens is that this is what uh, Romans 11 is talking about, that the Gentiles come into the kingdom of God first, and then Israel finally has its um, blindness lifted in part, and then it is the last part, the caboose of history. So Romans 11 is essentially riffing or commenting on this prophecy in Isaiah 19. Isaiah 19, therefore, is talking about a, a, a general um, um, confluence of the nations. This was also, by the way, a notion uh, described in Isaiah 2, the nations shall flow together into the mountain of the house of the Lord. So there, it would be very hard to find passages that's, that would suggest that they remain separate because, in fact, the very passage says, but they're not. They're not remaining separate. Even more to the point, if one wanted to look at, say, um, Genesis 9, 27, the prophecy that Noah says, he says, Japheth shall be enlarged and shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Well, that sounds like an interesting merger in its own right, does it not? On the face of it. Here supposedly is a passage that people say, well, it def defines for all time these three races that are to be separate, uh, or ethnicities, whatever you want to call them. Nowadays we're kind of moving away from the word toward uh, race, toward um, inter-ethnic. And I, um, I don't object to changing terminology in terms of some of the issues that are at stake here. But here, Japheth dwells in the tents of Shem. Uh, how do you account for that? Also, we'll notice this interesting aspect of Isaiah 19, is that there is a move by some kinists to say, hey, take a look at the Tower of Babel. These nations were all divided uh, to keep them separate nations. Well, there's two big problems with that notion. First, the very passage in which the confusion of language is instituted by God, and he, and he speaks to the sons of God in heaven about it, let us go do this, confuse their language. It says, you know, and a, um, a man shall not be able to hear the lip of his neighbor. In other words, every single individual had his own language. It wasn't as if God said, I'm going to take these group and give them one language and this group another language. There was a complete confusion of everything. So they were already, each individual tribe was already subdivided by individual humans. Secondly, the notion that the separation of languages is to enforce separation of nationalities forever uh, as fixed quantities and boundaries for all time falls on its face in Isaiah 19, on the language point. Why? Because in Isaiah 19.18, we read that uh, there'll be five cities uh, in Egypt that will speak the language with lip of Canaan, which is Hebrew. Uh, and the sixth city shall be called the city of destruction, which means it won't exist. So it means all the cities of Egypt shall speak Hebrew. And they'll be worshiping, if you will. And why is it that the, these Egyptians, these Gentiles, will be speaking Hebrew? Because Hebrew ultimately will be the one language that every single nation will know. There's a prediction in Isaiah 1918 that all nations shall know Hebrew. That will become a unifying factor among all nations. So the, nation, so the notion that all the nations are to be kept separate with their own tongues falls apart if, in fact, uh, Hebrew is to become the ultimate language that all shall know. Uh, and that way we'll actually know the law of God in its original tongue, the way that it was delivered by the hand of angels from Mount Sinai to us. So it's a powerful passage, and very few people deal with Isaiah 19 uh, because it's a troubling one to so many eschatologies, so many philosophies, so many theologies. And yet here it is taking a big machete to all these ideas that tend to predominate and crop up. So the obligation is to then take this, mission, this passage from Isaiah 19 and build it out properly. Now that takes work. That takes like writing a book or a, at least a big chapter of a book that deals with these passages, picks them all apart, and does it. There's no way on God's green earth that me talking on a Q&A am going to exhaust the depths of the things I'm discussing. I'm just scratching the surface. In fact, I'm scratching the pimple on the surface of these things. But to say that these are issues that need to be brought up and dealt with. So here's, that's how I think kinism needs to be dealt with. It needs to, we need to confront the issue biblically as a doctrine first and then pick it apart and do the things that it's, thank you for that. There's some material coming up from Chalcedon for those who want to take a look at those uh, links. They're useful. Uh, and so we have to then go to the scriptures, to the law and the testimony. To speak not according to these is because there's no light in them. So if there's a problem with the doctrine, we go to the law and the testimony to test it by the light. And so I would say, let's take this passage that is normally cited by kinists, Isaiah 19, and pick it apart and say, what does it really say when we take a look at the entire prophecy? Not just that it alludes to the fact that these are separate nations, but what are the predicated actions of these nations? And then all of a sudden the lid is blown off 
of a kinist interpretation. It and now they have to go figure out how to make sense of this. And if they can't, they have a choice. What's more important? Does my dogmatic tail wag the exegetical dog, or does the exegesis of scripture therefore correct my position? And then we can talk about action. Now here's where it gets interesting, because we then have the point of view is, what should we do with um, a, a teacher who holds a position that's injurious and victimizes certain people? And uh, in fact, I noticed that my article on abuse has been quoted uh, in connection with this, uh, and I think appropriately so. I believe that there is injury done to uh, inter-ethnic couples who are sound Christians in the faith, who are building God's kingdom, and then they come up, and then we hear this uh, idea that they are in adultery, that they, their uh, union is invalid in some way, shape, or form, uh, and constitutes adultery. Now, I'm also going to separate the two individuals involved and add a third individual. This is where I think it gets interesting to me from a moral perspective. What is our obligation to the victims? And I think it's a huge one. But because we, we put the victims on the table, haven't, we, we're not talking about doctrine anymore. We're talking about what are you going to do about these poor victims? Should we be, remain silent? And I say, we've remained silent too long, but with a different set of victims who are very much in parallel with the victims we're talking about. Mr. Serberti, what are you referring to? I know of a bunch of other victims who probably number 300 times more than the victims of these two individuals, Mr. Weaver and, say, Mr. Hammond. I think th I don't treat their particular views identically at all. Uh, they have some things in common and some things that are not in common. Uh, but let's take a look at this. The charge of adultery, that's a major charge. So. Why is it that there's calls for a boycott? I'm going to talk about boycott third, by the way, which I believe is unbiblical doctrine. But calls for a boycott for a conference in Pennsylvania, which didn't quite, I don't think it made 200 uh, people last year. Very teeny little thing up there. A conference, by the way, where Godfrey Kayaza, who's setting up a Christian university in Kampala, Uganda, and which I personally have funded over $15,000 for the purchase of his land, there, uh, he will be boycotted along with it. So his effort to try to bring the kingdom of God to Uganda will be cut short because of the boycott of this very small group. Now, I'm wondering why are we picking this issue and this small conference when, I, in fact, there is a pastor. I'm going to call him Pastor X, though some of you might know exactly who I'm referring to. There's a pastor out there who uniformly pulls crowds of thousands at homeschool conferences and worldview conferences, and in fact is having just such a conference today. Uh, well, not today, but in, 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 the, in the current time this year. And this particular individual, um, his position is um, remarriage, in most cases, is illegitimate, and it constitutes adultery. So uh, someone is divorced and then he remarries, that is an illegitimate marriage. It is adulterous. And in fact, it is so bad in his view that in the church that he uh, pastored, uh, I have it reported to me on Faithful Witness, that if... Uh, you have a family where the husband and the wife were previously married, but they're divorced, but they have united their families, have new children, have adopted, and the, the family is totally Christian from top to bottom. In other words, kingdom-oriented, gung-ho, doing God's work, in the trenches, that that man is blocked from becoming an elder. However, someone who was a former homosexual would be welcomed uh, on repentance. The problem with the married couple is incomplete repentance, you see. They can never make good on that. So that means it's worse in effect in homosexuality. Uh, homosexuality, if you read, say, Dr. Bonson's work on this topic, uh, he regards it as the burning out of man in his exegesis of passage of Roman 1, etc. Uh, that's a pretty serious claim to say uh, a marriage would be, therefore, uh, even um, remarriage, if you will, even more disqualifying for the office of elder than homosexuality. It makes it worse. And the people who are affected by this remarriage rule that is adulterous, I think are approximately 300 times more in number than those who are affected by the inter-ethnic marriage complaint of adultery. Who's going to go boycott, boycott those folks? Who's going to bring that to the table? In other words, I think we're looking at this little teeny thing in the corner, and I have, uh, and I feel shame for all those victims and, and grief for what they go through, but I'm saying, but what about this massive group of people who have been victimized by a parallel notion of what adultery is in marriage, 
that hasn't been properly dealt with. Again, because the law of God is not understood properly. Both Same problem in both issues. But the numbers are huge. Far more people are affected by that. Uh, what is What gives? Why is it that we are... Is there a privileged position if it's the guy who speaks to 5,000? Pastor X, we don't, we don't go after him on this. But the little guys, we're going to go after them and drive them out. I think that we should not strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. If anything, we should be doing all of it, right? The scripture says, these ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. So you probably should deal with the inter-ethnic adultery charges and deal with the victims of that and succor them, as they say, and heal them and assure them of their true status in the kingdom of God, and then do the same, probably first, with the big guy who's disenfranchised far more marriages as adulterous and uh, suffering from incomplete repentance. By the way, that incomplete repentance can be totally incomplete because uh, if you should happen to marry a sister, you can't undo that and marry the first woman again. That's explicitly forbidden in Scripture. So you see the problem here. So uh, we have big, big issues with Pastor X, and we are not dealing with them. Now we have a fourth aspect. I'm going to get to this before boycotting. The fourth aspect is you know, what's moving in the curtains behind me. That's the cat. <laughs> Cat is, uh, cat is disturbed by this discussion as much as I am. So the fourth, uh, third aspect is, uh, what's the proper venue? I've seen complaints. Is this a, rule, um, a Matthew 18 thing? Have we followed Matthew 18? Maybe Matthew 18 is not applicable. Maybe this we need to look at these church instructions, like from 1 Corinthians 5, or uh, Paul's dealing with Peter about his hypocrisy. But the fact of the matter is, this probably warrants something stronger than that. This might ro ro warrant an Acts 15 church council that's general and ecumenical across the board to deal with it once for all. We haven't had one since Chalcedon in 451 AD that actually dealt with all these issues and that dealt with Christology. Now we have the question of what's a valid marriage, and I think that needs to be dealt with. And therefore, it seems to me the proper venue for that would be an Acts 15 general council, bring everyone together, hack it out and bring our best scholars in on it. Don't let them be quiet. Help them, have them weigh in on it. Dr. Rashtuni, uh, in dealing with the Cure of Souls book, in the actual chapter called Cure of Souls, he says, here's some really complicated, messed up situations. And he said, and I took stock of them over the years and say, what, was, it, was it been right to speak or would it have been right to remain silent? Being that sometimes speaking worsens things and silence, uh, something can potentially blow over. It depends. This men, sin complicates everything. And so, too, going in there to try to resolve it. It's, it's pleasant to say and convenient to say, oh, this is a quick one, two, three. We just do this, this, this. There's no rubber stamps at Chalcedon. I'm sorry, we just don't have them. Lots of times people will bring uh, uh, something to my attention, and I will start to then reanalyze and try to say the case. You say, no, 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 we didn't want you to reanalyze whether we follow due process or anything. We want you to rubber stamp our conclusions. They said, and I already see problems in your due process. I can't do that. Oh, well, that's terrible. You know, we cannot just simply point out, say, that uh, Dr. Hammond has been excommunicated without also bringing in, in the spirit of Proverbs 18.17, Brian Abshire's assessment of that process and it's how lawful or lawless it was, uh, or at least raise the questions that are uh, implicit in bringing the opposite side into play. Otherwise, it's tendentious reasoning, that is, reasoning that shuts out anything but the one thing it wants to claim and then removes all the collateral arguments. We need to have that church council that deals with all these things together and brings the best scholarship in and, the most, and, and move in terms not of um, heat but of light at that point. That was the intention, in, um, and it worked because the Holy Spirit was in the work, of course, in Acts 15. We would need to then, of course, pray for that exact same illumination from him to open up the scriptures, because that's what he does to us, and its proper application. This means to me that it's all premised on the Word of God, so which all should be exegetical. It's pleasant and sometimes useful in debate to bring philosophy into the picture. Uh, for example, uh, defining things like genetic materialism or materialistic determinism, well, that's more like it, uh, various forms of determinism and saying, aha, see, uh, this is anti-gospel, and this is separate from the question of those who are injured as victims of the charge that their marriage is invalid, which is a really ugly, evil thing to say about legitimate marriage. 
Uh, and, uh, but now we're using this other approach and saying, therefore, being anti-gospel, you make a, a philosophical argument against it. That has limitations. It has some strength, internal strengths, but also has limitations. For example, if I were a kinist, I am not. But if I were, I would simply say, these are all God-created facts. You have to know, by the way, that most kinists have read some Rashtuni and Van Til, and they know their way around this stuff. Uh, they are not intellig uh, unintelligent in that respect. They are well-read, and they can simply uh, sidestep uh, this, the, these charges. What cannot be so easily sidestepped is exegesis, because the light of God's word will forbid it. Therefore, my counsel in respect to debating these things, uh, you have to then uh, deal with it completely in, in terms of the scriptures. Again, in the principle of Isaiah 8.20. So, next point. Boycotts. Are they biblical? There's a whole question related to this that I think is resolved for us once and for all very clearly in uh, Nehemiah 13. In Nehemiah 13, we read that they were buying and selling from the Canaanites, if you will, on the outside of the, of the wall, uh, on the Sabbath day, and Nehemiah caught wind of it, and he basically said this to them. He said, uh, you can buy and sell any day you want with the pagans and these heathens, but you will not do so on the Sabbath. If you do, I will lay hands upon you. He was going to block the Sabbath violation, but he was going to allow them to buy and sell anything they needed uh, f with respect to the uh, uh, these people who were going to use that money to do evil things with it. It's that simple. Now, does that, does that mean, in fact, that the Jews, by buying things and were subsidizing the pagans in their evil actions? No, because Ezekiel 18 makes it very clear, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. There's no such thing as a propagation of guilt. Did they, they, did they use the money for something else that's illegal, uh, evil? Then God holds them responsible for it. There is no transmission of guilt with the cash. Um, but what it, So what has happened in American um, concepts of battle, polemics, is uh, we believe you the proper approach would have been to buy and sell uh, from anybody any day of the week, including the Sabbath, but don't buy and sell from pagans. So we get the exact opposite doctrine from that laid out in Nehemiah 13, when Nehemiah says you can buy from any pagan and heathen you want, except on the Sabbath, and we say it's okay to buy and sell on the Sabbath, but just don't buy from pagan heathen, pagans and heathen, heathens. So my conclusion is we should probably re-examine these notions. Plus, the problem is that a boycott is, in effect, a weapon of the flesh. And it's going to be one of those situations where you, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you're going to raise boycotts, boycotts will come back your direction because they're not uh, spiritual weapons by definition. Uh, they're actually another pea shooter when we don't even want to use the, the bazookas, as they call them, from the Word of God. Uh, that's the proper weapon that uh, tears down strongholds not boycotts, not compulsion. By the way, this notion of compulsion is interesting to me because if once you get down that path, uh, you have, to, you have there's this risk on one side of get, entering into the territory of the donatist, donatism. I have a couple of quotes from Rashtuni on donatism that are interesting. They were a movement that was involved in church purity, but they kind of went in a, in a direction that was uh, not as positive as one would have expected. In the name of purity, this is Rashtuni writing, in the name of purity, the Donatists became persecutors. Because the Donatists stressed purity and holiness more than grace and forgiveness, they were ready to believe in compulsion. The Donatist temper believes with Job, Job's sorry friends that wisdom was born with them and will die with them. The Donatist is harsh, arrogant, censorious, and impatient. This looks to me like something as a warning, saying let's not cross these lines in our zeal. Zeal is a good thing, and don't, don't misunderstand me. But we also want to make sure that our zeal is according to knowledge. We don't want to be like the Romans 10 folks, those the Hebrews that, G, that Paul talks about, that has zeal, but not according to knowledge. Zeal must be hemmed in and guided by knowledge into the channels of light and healing. Because the scripture says God sends us as ambassadors, and we are ministers of reconciliation across the board. So, the, um, that is an important aspect of Donatism. So let's um, wind that back then and say this, that, that the notion of a boycott, I think Galcedon does not regard that as the proper approach. Uh, there may be other reasons for um, coming out of an organization or not participating in something, but the notion of a boycott is not the one to use. Like I said, 
if we're going to be doing that kind of tool, why is it that there's a privileged position for Pastor X, who is his view on adultery in remarriage affects 300 times more people than that of, say, uh, a, uh, John Weaver, for example. I think that is a problem that needs to be dealt with. And again, the level that we should be dealt with is a, uh, a full board ecumenical thing on the order of an X 15. It's convenient uh, to say, well, all we need to do is take shots at these two people. But that's not how it works. That's not how something this fundamental, which is actually spread in different forms across Christendom with different notions, uh, can be put back together again. So, um, by the way, I'm going to scale back and take a look at some comments. Comments that are not exegetical, I will acknowledge as uh, evasive. Because then they are not bringing the scripture to the table. If I bring a scriptural argument and then a personal attack ensues, an ad hominem, or some philosophical notion, or some inference, that means that we're not grappling with the scripture. Scripture now, the burden of proof, once a scripture has been laid out, has to be accepted by the other side in good faith. If someone does not accept it in good faith, then they are not operating in terms of any other mission other than self-aggrandizement, in my opinion. If I'm wrong, then they can prove to me by grappling with the scripture. Or saying, we will come back and grapple with this. We're not prepared today, but you bring some points up that need to be dealt with. Fine. Let's, let's see those points. Let's see the answers. Some of these things take time to develop. There may be a reply. In fact, I noticed that even on the, um, that blogspot.com that I recommended, the author said, I might be um, an error about this point or that point. Let's, let's have at it. Let's, and they go to round two and round three. If it was a cut and dry thing, it would have been simply, boom, a smash. But that's not how it works, is it? It was something that's developing with time and effort. Because a complex question that is heated needs more light and not more heat. You can turn up the heat all you want, and all you're going to do is flames and smoke, and that's not going to be acceptable. That's not going to get anything. Chalcedon is all about building the kingdom, and we start with the Word of God to build it with. We don't start with uh, genetics to build it with. We start with the Word of God to build it with. And uh, if it arrives at genetics, then, can, then someone's going to have to prove that and show it and establish it and show why the scriptures that were brought to bear, see out of Isaiah 19 or Daniel, uh, Genesis 9:27 says something different than it says. That's what we have to do. It's that simple. So, let's see what the uh, what the stuff looks like. It looks like there's been a lot of activity here. Okay, there's John's original question, which I didn't catch the last wording on. If you dissolve nations, I would say the victim is God. I'm not convinced that anyone is calling for dis dissolution of a single nation. Uh, sim that's not what's going on. It is rather that there's liberty and freedom between the nations, and they uh, acknowledge um, their internal value of whatever is valuable in them, and I think it's only what is built on the, on the rock of God's word that's of value, uh, and uh, what's built on the sand of man's testimony, and uh, they each acknowledge each other's contribution in this area. So hardly a case that Isaiah 19 is dismantling things, but rather exemplifying freedoms and liberties and what is the premise of their coming together? To worship God. There's an altar, and there is an altar built at the border of Egypt and Asher, Assyria, and said, and is accepted by God, which is astonishing when you think that the altar built in the northern kingdom at Bethel was condemned by God. It didn't belong, it was not real, it did not, was not legitimate. Yet this border built in the corner of Egypt and Assyria is legitimate in God's kingdom. So it means that the kingdom is more oriented toward that toward that kind of thing. Okay, let's see what else is going on here. John Reasoner again. I understood there to be a distinction between outright pagans and those who claim Christ yet are false teachers. This has more to do with proper fellowship than has to do with economic and fleshly motivated boycotts, which is good. I have not ever met uh, John Weaver or spoken to him or emailed him or had any contact with him, and I think I've only sat in on one about 1985 or 86 lecture given by Peter Hammond that uh, Chalcedon had put on way back when, I think it was in Sacramento, California, I believe, or San Juan, somewhere, in the, somewhere over there in California. And I don't know what they recall ever having spoken to him. So it's not a ma so this is interesting. So you're talking about a, a, a fellowship thing, but th since there's questions about injury and victims, once you bring that up, I'm going to bring up the other victims that have been left out and that, and regard that as illegitimate to leave them out.
because they are far more in number and the injury is more serious because it's declaring their marriage is worse than, in, by inference, worse than homosexuality. That's a pretty serious uh, impl implied charge if you say, well, I will certainly can entertain having an, an elder in this church who was a former uh, repentant homosexual, but I certainly cannot have you with a wonderful, glorious family because you are remarried. See, that, 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 you're, that is an incomplete um, repentance according to Pastor X, and that constitutes a form of adultery. Because they simply will quote right out of the passage, if you remarry another person, you commit adultery. And so it's right there in the text. So that's the answer Pastor X gives, without, and he says there is no ex uh, exception clause. And so, boom, you're stuck. Uh -huh. And that's how that works. So I think both issues have to be dealt with simultaneously. And that's where I'm saying there's linkage, because if victims are important, then these victims in front of us, with the inter-ethnic charge of their, of their marriage being invalid, uh, are no less important than the massive amount in number implicated and indicted under the other notion, where there's plenty of people going to hear this pastor. Uh, now, I believe the pastor certainly could be corrected on this position, but he's gone public with his view, and that's the way it's going to be for the moment. So, uh, Sean and Selma makes a very good point there. Um, and I think I've seen it where they backed off saying that Dr. Rashtuni wasn't necessarily a strong proponent of kinism if he, if he had any... Uh, if he qualified as a kinist at all, it would be as a weaker form of it. And even that is mitigated by his own personal practice, since he did, in fact, uh, perform interracial marriage. And uh, that's been established and, and fully documented. And, and I happen to know from personal experience what he does is that he counsels both of the parties um, uh, and blesses them, particularly after the marriage. It's one of the things he enjoys doing up in his uh, easy chair uh, after the ceremony is performed at uh, Chalcedon. Now, this is all ancient history for you folks, so... But you can see that we're seeing a lot of heat here. Okay, Bill Evans is here, my dear brother. Yeah, uh, integrity is an interesting word. It, it simply means wholeness, that uh, they... No one wants to lose any kind of cultural capital that is premised on the Word of God. That would be a, a tragedy. Fortunately, God is very good at protecting his cultural capital. Let me explain how he does this. The Word of God was lost for a long time. Look, Hilkiah pulls it out of the crack in the corner of the temple wall. Hey, what's this? He brings it to Josiah, opens it up, tears his clothes. It's the Word of God, and we're in trouble because we are walking uh, against it. God protects what he wants to preserve. Uh, it is not something we have to worry about and, uh, uh, because in all things, God is the mover and shaker. We need to have a Calvinistic approach to these things, and we have to have enough faith in God uh, and say, you know, all these things we should be able to count but dung for the saving excellency of Christ uh, and uh, him crucified, etc. So there's a, a point there of comparison. Uh, it is important but not so important as it clouds everything else. And therefore, when, it's, when I think when, the, when our, um, the notion of the union, which is covenantal, uh, is distinguished from all the things, I think we're in a better shape. There's a whole art of bunch of uh, discussion about culture to start with. And so, here's where the problem is. We are trying to rebuild a Christian culture. And there's dispute as to what shape that should take. So does that not require more light and more work and more uh, digging into scriptures to get to that point? It seems to me, yes, we, it does require exactly that. Versus this shooting each other in the back stuff. You know, Christians are the only army that shoot their own wounded. And so it goes uh, even into the present uh, era. And this is a crisis. By the way, if you want to talk more about that topic, tune in with me tomorrow night with the Book of the Month Club, and we talk about the cure of souls when we deal exactly with these kind of you know, enormities and outrages that are propagated across Christendom. Dr. Rishton did an excellent job in this text. Let's see, some more questions. Uh, Brett has asked something, but the problem is, Brett, that um, I don't, I see the, it says, do you agree with John Frame who has written comma, and then I don't see the rest. If you're not you're new to these uh, discussions, Q&As, I usually get to see four or five lines before uh, this particular application that uh, Facebook put out snips it and doesn't let me see the rest. Uh, but I'll get I'll roll around back to it and see if I can get the rest of it. I promise. 
Uh, what would consistency demand in regards to Pastor X and Kinnis? I believe all involved desire that consistency and wonder what that consistency looks like. For example, I've also written strongly against the permanence view of marriage as of other recons. John Randrew Reisner, I am on the same page with you. I think we need to... Uh, but look what we've done here. You've written against it, and so uh, I think it is right to do. We've dealt with the, trying to shed light on this area that the darkness creates uh, ill effects and injures people. And that's the kind of the point I'm bringing. So, yes, I think we need to deal with both. You, as yourself, have said, I've written against both these issues so that we don't end up declaring either kind of marriage an adultery and an invalid union and therefore um, creating victims uh, that should not that should be our fellow uh, co soldiers, foot soldiers for Christ, marching along with us to push the kingdom forward. That's where they should be, rather than being wondered, what's my status? They told me my marriage is kaput. It doesn't even exist. It's invalid, etc., etc. Uh, I don't want to know, if you guys are having debates amongst yourselves, <laughs> that's, uh, that's certainly uh, uh, your prerogative here. But I was going to see if Brett McAtee had the rest of his comment. Uh, and I haven't seen it yet. So I ha if you want to email it to me, martin at calcine.edu, or prepare a full question for next time, next Sunday, uh, I can certainly take a look and see if I agree with John Frame's comment. But I do, do not believe that uh, there's a one-world race. In fact, interestingly enough, when I preach on this issue of um, the one-world government, I even call it uh, Liberty from New World Orders. It's my lecture. I've been doing it since about 2012. I even delivered it last year in Australia. Balkanization is an interesting phenomenon, is it not? And I believe it's a very real one. And it's basically one way that God prevents a new world order of any kingdom aside from Christ's. You see, there were six world kingdoms in history, starting with Egypt, followed by Assyria. Uh, and, and then we have, you know, the um, Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Macedonia, and then finally Rome. And uh, after Rome, there is no more one world order except for the Christ kingdom. So that's the end of, one, of, uh, of world empires at that point. Prophetically, the scripture lays this out. Uh, and Hengstenberg does a very good job of... Uh, explaining why the four beasts uh, have the two extra ones mentioned in uh, uh, Revelation 13, which are the first two, Egypt and Assyria. Um, Daniel left him off because he was living in the third, third head of that beast, which we would say was, but now, but isn't anymore. So there were only six, and the seventh one is Christ's kingdom, and it's the only one that will have dominion over all. And so that means everything else is a smaller nation. But the question is, what is their relationship with each other? And I say, what are we going to do with a passage like Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem? It is given as a prophecy by Noah, the most righteous man who ever lived at the time, who seemed to have a taste for wine. But I don't think he was uh, inebriated when he made the comment. I don't think scripture would have put a positive spin on it at that point. Are there any other questions? And could ground control tell me what time it is, how much more time we have on this? So I know whether to lengthen the discussion out some or whether to cut it short and invite folks to um, send their questions, follow-ups uh, through email. Okay. I see. Uh, comment, please, on the potential of slander in Facebook threads where people give me two opinions and perpetuate disharmony. Nine minutes. Well, that could probably take some time. So here's the deal. There's a word I'm going to teach you if you don't know it. It's Latin. Res judicata, res judicata, and it's uh, used in law. It means it's a matter already settled. So if you treat something as a res judicata, a matter, a matter already settled, then you can basically say, or be feel justified in saying, what further need have we witnesses? Right? We have already got this thing nailed down. There, now we're going to go to the execution or the penalty phase, pecuniary phase, the the stage at which we're going to then. Uh, all agree on the judgment, as opposed to reopening the question of guilt or the nature of the guilt or the magnitude of the guilt uh, or other aspects related to it, we're going to go ahead and simply agree that this has been dealt with. Um, and that is a problem, because if that's not the case, that is a res judicata, but rather that there's aspects when you look at it and say, wait a minute, there's hold, some holes in this case that have yet to be filled in. We shouldn't, and that's why the, the objection is don't go to, for a rush to judgment. Don't follow a multitude, even if they're a very convincing multitude, and they're your buddies and friends. I have them too. Uh, I see brothers that I'm very close to arguing on both sides of the thing, and it, and it, and it is um, painful to me to see. 
uh, people that I know are strong Reconstructionists and working for the kingdom, attacking each other and vilifying each other on, on Facebook over this, and it is uh, not a good thing. It's because uh, the notion has been floated and has been implied that these this we've already got this all settled. It's already a safe, stage three a Romans eighteen, so we're excommunication now. Then someone else says, "Well, really, it's not a room. I mean, a Matthew eighteen thing. There's no eighteenth chapter of Romans. A uh, yeah, Matthew eighteen thing." And uh, it's really something else. It's more like a, a Peter versus um, Paul thing, where Paul rebukes Peter. By the way, you're dealing with two apostles there. And in the case of 1 Corinthians 5, you're looking at something that happens inside a local church, or at least a, a city church, Corinthian church, uh, as opposed to kingdom-wide. So I think for the kingdom-wide stuff, you'd really do need to have the Acts 15 ecumenical council and bring everyone together. In, bring all the seminaries together that are faithful, that are orthodox, or even close, if you will. Uh, get a consensus saying this is where we stand uh, without compromise. That's a big problem because ecumenicalism usually involves compromise. In order to get everyone to agree, you have to then chop the truth off and soften it. That's not acceptable in this area. We have to then find that core of individuals and groups that are willing to have this. You know. Coalition on Revival, James Grimstead's group, has been trying to put together exactly this kind of thing between all the various sectors of conservative Christendom to have a consensus where it would be most important. We don't have one. He tried for the 20th century, now we're trying for the 21st century. He tried to co, um, co coordinate that with the uh, 500th anniversary of um, you know, Reformation events. You know, hence, 2017 would have been a good year to be in Wittenberg, say, uh, where they were. Uh, but we haven't gotten enough buy-in on everybody to go together with this. So, that's the problem. Uh, and so that's why I think we need to go. We need to move in, in that particular direction. In the meantime, the, the slanderous comments or the things like that uh, involved in this are problematic because they go both ways. I am, have not been satisfied with either the responses uh, and the counter-responses to date. I think um, in all the attempt to do what's right, there's some blinding effect on both sides. Uh, and we need to open our eyes wider and, and slow down. We need to be slow to anger, slow to speak, but quick to listen. And these, uh, these particular properties, these particular attributes are not part of the current debate. This is um, closer to moving... Uh, far too quickly to judgment when someone else says, wait a minute, can we establish this? Oh, we've already done that. Can we see it? Well, it's way back in the third somewhere. Well, every, are we supposed to just take it on authority of, of several people that has already been dealt with? That's, that's an interesting point to take. I don't know if I would ever accept that in a church. I see too many things coming crossing my desk where I get involved or I'm counseling where, uh, in, where various abuses from seminaries even and, and, and uh, large church and general assemblies get involved. And so, uh, okay, one final question here. Yes, Douglas is bringing in the First Timothy five nineteen and 20. Uh, discusses accusing and rebuking elders in sin. What types of areas of sin would qualify rebuke as opposed to uh, chapter 1 of the chapter in tree? So um, let's go ahead and move that one to the next chapter because, uh, or rather the next week, uh, I'll go ahead and um, I have um, ground control send that to me and saying we'll start with that question next week. Uh, in terms of that particular aspect. Because, of course, there's the whole question of whether it's right to send a message. In almost all cases in Scripture, the notion of sending a message is done by the pagans and heathens. Because they operate, as Western says, in front of a crowd, in front of an audience, as in, opposed to us, supposedly, Coram Deo, operating in front of God. We're not supposed to be sending any messages in that effect, uh, at least in that style, in terms of modern, postmodern narratives being floated on Facebook. This is not the way God's work is to be done. It, uh, it might be quick and easy and dirty and cheap and, and, and effective, trolling as always is, but we should be able to, be able to rise above that, saying, you know, I'm going to take that back and start fresh with a biblical analysis and pull this stuff together. By the way, that's the harder way to take it. If you're going to go uh, unpack, say, Isaiah 19, like I've said, we're going to be doing, probably preparing in all likelihood a position paper, it's something that's going to not be an overnight project. But... The effort and labor put into building that foundation properly will pay off. If you don't think so, take a look at the gigantic shelf of books that Dr. Rush Dooney wrote. Not that I'm comparing myself to him by any stretch, but what was he doing? He said, I'm going to continue to build out the foundations over and over again, point by point, and take more territory for Christ in the process. 
So too, these issues, as heated as they are, can be taken captive with the right amount of energy devoted to taking these thoughts, thoughts captive to the obedience to Christ, which implies a knowledge of Scripture, enduring sound doctrine. It means that the process of putting the proper approaches together to deal with questions like this is to confront these things. And fairly, you must even treat your adversary fairly. You must treat your enemy fairly. Uh, you maybe even more so, because it's, it's very easy to treat our friends right, uh, very easy to treat our enemies, uh, what we regard as the enemy of the truth, say. Uh, but they need to have the benefit of saying, we will come at you them uh, with the spirit, Christ-like spirit. Uh, and that has to be pursued. And if it leads to a First uh, Timothy 5, 19, 20 um, kind of situation, so be it. But let's make sure we're established on all the facts of the case. So they don't prematurely move to res judicata. It's a, re, it's a matter already determined. It's a matter already settled. Some of these things are not as settled as the kinists or the anti-kinists think they are. There's more work to be done. I'm absolutely convinced that the where the direction is going to take. But that's simply because I've had some looking at these passages for 35 years uh, and know that there's a whole host of scriptures that have yet to even be brought to bear on this question and they need to be dealt with because uh, if, a, if an error needs to be rooted out to, to the nail. I have a book on my shelf here by Harold O.J. Brown called Heresies. It's a big, thick book. Guess what? These things are not in that book yet. Someone's going to have to write another chapter on this. Why is that? Because it's relatively new. Uh, and therefore, the issues in it have to be raised all over again. Now, the ther heresies that are dealt with in that book were not solved overnight. I hate to tell you this. They were resolved with hard work. They were resolved with some pain, some death even, involved in some of these things, as Dr. Rushdoony talks about in the Foundations of Social Order. Uh, the Doctrine of the Trinity was a costly one for some people who lost their lives in brutal beatings over them upholding the Orthodox doctrine. So we haven't yet gone that far with these issues, and we're going to need to consider the weightiness of Scripture and the Lord that we serve and being faithful to the written Word. That's what Chalcedon's mission is. We're going to go dig into the Word and apply it, and apply it in the way that God says it should be applied, eye to eye, face to face, toe to toe, gently but firmly, and build out from there. That's what we have to do. Yes, so uh, send any questions to, cal to ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. Again, I, I know that Brett McTee was, going to, McTee was going to ask a question, and we didn't get the benefit of it. Uh, I hope that he will go ahead and send his question as well, uh, and so that we can answer it. Uh, he's on the other side of the divide from me on this topic, but I am more than willing to ask, answer the question that he is posing. Uh, and again, my interests are generally exegetical, because I think if it's not scriptural, we are too, too many steps removed from scripture. We're in the realm of philosophy and inferences. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about inferences being a great way to go. There's an article about Rush Dooney that Rush Dooney wrote called Inferences. One should consider reading it and taking a good look at that and seeing there's limitations to it. There's dangers involved in using inferences. We're always better off looking solidly at scripture and dealing with what the word written is. And that's our obligation. And that's what Chalcedon's about, is propagating the word of God without apology, and uh, so that might be healing word to all. That might be a big order, but God's bigger than all our various prejudices. Thank you for your uh, um, attention. Again, rec recommending the Book of the Month Club tomorrow, Cure the Souls. I'll be leading that with Andrea Schwartz. Thank you for your time, and we'll catch up with everyone next week. Send your questions to that uh, email address there. It looks like we're not done with this topic yet, which doesn't surprise me. God bless all.